Thanks for joining us as we continue our series thinking about wise or foolish, picking up the promise in James 1 verse 5 from our New Start Sunday. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Well, Jesus spoke a lot about money and investing and all related things. Way too much to cover just in one day. So today, we're just going to look at two parables that Jesus told about saving and investing. One in particular sounds a bit strange, not the sort of thing that we think Jesus would say. But before we come to them, let's think for ourselves, what wisdom about money were you handed on by your parents? What wisdom were you handed on? For me, I wasn't given very much advice, at least not that I can remember. I certainly wasn't told how to spot a scam. That wasn't necessary when I was growing up. I wasn't taught to buy the very best quality that you can afford or end up paying more later. And I wasn't told that the eighth wonder of the world is the power of compound interest. Well, I wonder where you invest your money. There are lots of places, aren't there? Maybe ISAs or the stock market in property. Anybody own racehorses? No? Uh, Bitcoin? Non-fungible tokens? That's the latest thing. Well, probably more sensibly, I wonder how many of us are investing in a child trust fund. That's not investing for ourselves, but that's deliberately putting money in to a fund ready for children or grandchildren for their later life. But this morning, we're not here to trade worldly wisdom. We want to go to the source of all truth and real wisdom. So let's pray again those verses from James. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. So we ask you, Lord, to give generously to us all without finding fault. Give us the wisdom we need for saving and investing. Well, the first of our two parables is from Luke chapter 12 starting at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labour or spin. 
Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I expect many of us hearing that were we thinking, if only, if only we had an abundant harvest. The climate is changing, the environment is changing as a result, and settled ways of farming aren't working so well, even with new technology. If only we didn't have to spend so much on food and fuel. Or if only we hadn't had to flee our country because of war or violence. If only we weren't needing to support family back home as well as ourselves here, as well as the huge fees of moving to a safer country. Well, that's why I read the second part as well. For to you, Jesus says from here in verse 22, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. And verse 29, do not set your heart on what you want to eat or drink. Do not worry about it, he says. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Father God knows. He owns everything anyway, and he's not slow to give us what we need. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. He likes himself, do you remember, to a good human father who, when his son asks him for bread, does what? Well, he doesn't give him a stone, he gives him bread. And moreover, the, the father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. It's, it's already happened. We can't see all of it, sure, but we are living under Jesus' rule and sovereignty already. And whether you have little or you have much, in verse 33, Jesus gives us the way that economics works where he is king. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying, even if you have possessions, hold them lightly to stop them possessing you, which our possessions do to us, funnily enough. Give them to others. Give them to those who need them. And as you do... God is putting deposits in the bank of his kingdom for you. Like a parent in a child trust fund, God is putting deposits in the bank for you. Seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Store up that treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. This doesn't mean, by the way, that we should have no savings or or no storehouses. Because elsewhere in Scripture, we are encouraged, aren't we, to make sensible provision for the periods of drought when the crops fail and what that means for us in our day-to-day life now. You see, he's commenting on the rich man not because he had 
barns, but because he was tearing them down to build bigger ones and not being generous with it. That's what Jesus was warning about. And this goes for churches too. And here at Christ Church, we have some savings that have been ring-fenced for unforeseen emergencies. For example, if we had a a sudden major problem with this building and we couldn't hire it out, we would lose a third of our income very quickly. As it turned out, we did when the pandemic hit. And so we keep three months of operating costs in reserve to ensure that we can continue to pay our staff and our utility bills. Well, let's now hear the second parable. And it will help us to understand it well, to know that a talent, as is described in the story, is not primarily a skill. That's a a meaning that has come out of this particular parable, but later on. But then a talent was a very large sum of money. Experts suggest that it was the equivalent to the annual pay of a labourer for 19 years. So we're reading from Matthew 25, Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. It will be like a man going on a journey, who calls his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has been, who has, will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you find... Like me, the ending there is a bit surprising, a not very spiritual sounding. Let's break this down and have a closer look. The first thing is, who is Jesus talking about? And who is he talking to? Well, this is one of the parables about the kingdom. And the context before it and after it makes it clear that the, in the story, the master is Jesus himself, and the servants are his followers. And so that makes it something that we have to listen to because it applies to us 
as well. And in this parable, each servant is given something of his master's assets. And not just a little something, is it? It's decades and decades worth of income. Which is fantastic, isn't it? God is entrusting us, every one of us, with some major resources for his kingdom. This is serious stuff, isn't it? These things are precious to the Lord, and yet he entrusts them to us. But we can't fail to notice that they don't all get given the same amount. Five talents, two talents, and one talent. Each according to his ability. And that's an important detail, isn't it? A couple of days ago, I was at Gatwick Airport uh, waiting to pick up a friend. And and I was looking at the, the families walking around. And I didn't see, thankfully, a family which had a huge suitcase and was asking a toddler to pull it or to lift it. No, the toddlers had little backpacks. They were doing their part according to their ability and their size and their strength. It was the adults or the older teenagers carrying the heavy suitcases. You see, the Lord knows us. And he knows the full potential of each person for serving in his kingdom. He designed that potential into each of us when he created us. No one is entrusted with more than he can handle. But neither is he entrusted with less than he can handle. The person entrusted with little will be required to, all, to do all that he can with what he has been given. You see, all of us are to live up to our full potential by God's strength, with his wisdom and for his kingdom. And this stewardship could cover all sorts of things. Time, talents, spiritual gifts, our energy, our personality, our attitudes, our experiences, and our material resources. But however, if you feel you have nothing to offer, that God hasn't entrusted you with much at all, then please, please speak to a Christian friend who knows you. And ask them, what do they see that God has given you? Because it's often easier for other people to see what God has given us than for us to see it ourselves. And sometimes actually the other way around, that they can confirm actually that that the Lord hasn't given us something that we maybe dearly wish he had. Investing is always a risky business. Because who knows when war or famine might come. But the servant here at once said, got down to work, used the wisdom that they had from the time to turn a profit that the master was looking for. And the result when he returned, well, the first two had each made 100% return on their investment. The master is pleased, praises them. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not only that, but he gives them extra responsibility, entrusts them with more, and finally invites them both to share in his happiness. This isn't an ordinary master-servant relationship, is it? For the Christian, this is joining the Father in the place that he has designed for us all along, where there is nothing to steal our joy. Only God's wealth God's treasures to enjoy, all perfectly shared. The point is clear for us, isn't it? When the king returns, he will require an accounting from us. And those who have consistently invested their lives obediently and wisely, according to heaven's priorities, not our own, will have something to offer the king. And this return may include our own personal growth and maturity, Souls brought into the kingdom, spiritual infants who have been raised to maturity, needs compassionately ministered to, wounds healed, conflicts reconciled, and truth lovingly told. The investment we will have made for this return will be all we have been entrusted with in this life, and it could be from our time, wealth, opportunities, relationships, 
our natural talents and our spiritual gifts, and how we use God's word, God's spirit, and serve God's church. Will you get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Join me in my happiness. Or will you hear what the third servant did? He didn't actually work at it. He just buried the cash and dug it up much later and presented it back to the master. This servant didn't understand or or know the heart of his master and was fearful of him. This is the picture of a Christian who has been entrusted with valuable things but does not contribute to the kingdom's advancement. Perhaps like a child who is given an expensive bike for their birthday, but they decide they don't want to touch it. Something good and valuable is just wasted. Now we've come to understand the word talent to mean all sorts of things. Knowledge, health, our strength, our time, intellect, advantages, opportunities and the spiritual gifts that God gives to us, like teaching or administration or healing or mercy. And they therefore can symbolise more than money, but not less than money. Because money matters to Jesus in all the things he said. And it's quite clearly here from this passage, the master's money that we're talking about explicitly. And so we don't need to limit the application of this to just our money, but we can't be quick to make it about everything except money. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, I want to apply this in two different ways today. Firstly, as a church, and then as individuals or couples. So let's think about Jesus' words and how they apply here to us at Christ Church. There are some churches who scrape along with no savings, living each year or even each month by faith with what the Lord will provide for them. And there are others, and Christ Church is one of them at the moment, who have built up savings through the faithful gifts of its members over previous years. And as best I can tell, we built up savings during the early part of the 2010s, when we had a a significantly more affluent membership than we do now, and when our running costs were lower. But before I go on to say what we're doing about that, I just need to check that we understand a few things uh, about Christchurch and its funding, which is a little bit unusual. So with the benefit of this slide, Christchurch is a number of things. It is primarily, of course, a church, part of God's worldwide church. But you can see it's also part of four different denominations, Methodist, Baptist, United Reformed, and the Anglican Church. We're also a UK-registered charity, like almost all churches. And we're also effectively a small business that of running Chinnam's larger community centre. Now, doing this costs uh, a bit over £4,000 a week. And I need to make clear that no external body pays for that. Occasionally, I find people that say, oh, but the Church of England pays for the church, doesn't it? <laughs> if only. Sadly not. We have to pay everything from a combination of our Christian giving and, in our case, from income from hiring the building. And very roughly, that's two-thirds and one-third of our income. Our biggest costs are, like most organisations, paying our staff and the utility bills. We also give 10% of our income, our Christian income, to our mission partners. But this year, we've seen our church income from church members go down slightly in real terms. We're now £300 a week short of what we need. 
But that's not our focus today. Today we're focusing on our savings. And here's a chart that I'm going to build up year by year of what our savings have been in the last few years. So starting here in 2021, you can see that we have set aside reserves, set aside money that we don't touch except in emergencies. And we believe we're following good practice in this. Then in 2022, we decided to set aside or to designate £40,000 of that money to improve the facilities in the old half of our building, which hadn't seen significant improvements in several decades, trying to get it fit for purpose for us and for the next generation. In 2023, you can see for various reasons, we landed up not managing to spend any of that facilities development fund, as we called it. And we had some large one-off gifts given to us and so our savings grew. And so at the end of that year, we still had over £60,000 of cash in hand. And that is a significant sum of money. Sitting there, not doing anything other than earning a tiny bit of interest. Now, I don't think it was a coincidence that I landed up reading a few days ago of a United Reformed Church treasurer who commented that some years earlier they had received a massive legacy and he reported that he watched over the years a terrible corruption his words of the members discipleship as they increasingly found their security in the legacy and not in their God You might remember that in Luke chapter 10, Jesus instructs 72 of his disciples to go out in pairs to start telling people about him. And he told them not to take any money. They had to rely on the goodwill of the people they met. Ultimately, of course, though, coming from Father God and his provision. Because God provides for his work. The great missionary Hudson Taylor summarised Jesus' teaching in this way, that God's mission, done God's way, never lacks for God's provision. And so we take it that we shouldn't be building bigger barns at Christ Church, but instead we want to be investing that cash, not, not with the bankers, but investing it in mission. And if we do that, it will be a win-win in God's economy. A win because we're stepping out in mission now, investing it for the people who need to know about Jesus now. And it's a win in the future because we will have less cash. We will need to be more dependent, reliant on God. So what should we do with this? Well, I'm pleased to say that our church council last week decided to invest most of the remainder of this savings into a new staff post. And instead of being a community minister, a position that we have been unable to fill for a number of reasons, I'll explain more about that another week, we're instead narrowing the focus of that post slightly to focus on children, families and youth both of growing outreach to those groups. And we have many, many of them now. And a great place to start from. As well as investing in the discipleship of our children and our young people. Again, I'll talk more about that another time. But we've decided and we've set aside another £40,000 out of that savings over the next two years for this purpose. The figures from 2024 here can only be an estimate, but certainly by next year we expect to be spending significantly from both development funds. Now, this isn't, of course, spending for the sake of it. Our leadership and our council have spent a lot of time praying and discussing these things in the last few months. I'm happy to take questions on this afterwards, and I hope others on the church council will as well. 
But we'll come back to this in more detail in our church meeting in late October and discuss in more detail our income and expenditure. But let me close by the second application, which is to us personally. How are you investing your money and your abilities, your time, in building God's kingdom? It will look different in different stages of your life. As your situation and your responsibilities, your vocations and your income changes. But think to yourself, how are you investing now? How are you investing now? And if you were a Christian five years ago, how were you investing before the pandemic? Or ten years ago? How is it different? And where is the Spirit nudging you today? James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And so we pray together. Loving Father God, we take you at your word. Help us as individuals, as families, and as a church to be more aware of your kingdom. And then help us to invest our money and our talents towards it. May we in time hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And Lord, you know, we want to grow our team to work with children, youth and families and to reach out more effectively with your good news. Please bless this step of faith we're making to invest our savings. Please provide the right person or people at the right time to join us for that mission. Amen.